Hey, good morning, everybody. It is uh, Sunday morning, it's 1030, it's time to worship. So I'm so thankful that you are joining us. Um, special good morning to those watching at fcctuscola.online.church. Good morning to you. Um, good morning to everyone watching at fcctuscola.com. Good morning to everyone watching on the church's Facebook. And then also, uh, if you're watching any other time on the YouTube channel, good morning to you or good afternoon or whatever it might be. Uh, we're going to worship together this morning from the cafe. Uh, if you attend on Sundays when we're meeting in person, uh, we have a little coffee area before the service where people meet together and chat and catch up and, and it's a really awesome time of fellowship and so first of all I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, volunteers their, their time and their efforts to make sure that happens uh, every Sunday. Uh, I've had many of the snacks and they are yummy and coffee is always a wonderful thing. If you know anything about me you know that uh, coffee pretty much keeps me alive so I'm thankful for people who provide such things. Um, lots of ministry going on in, in areas like this that uh, you see and you take part in, but uh, we don't always think about. So we're going to worship from the cafe today. So let's let's start uh, with a word of prayer, and we'll go before our God. We uh, we love you, God. We praise you, and we want this time to be nothing more than than just uh, something that we lift up to you, an honoring uh, of you, and a glorifying of you. And God, help us to have our hearts and minds focused where they should be, not on what we're doing or what's going on in our, our houses or uh, the, this endless list of distractions that we have. Um, God, help us to take this time to just focus on you. And what a, what a wonderful friend we do have in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, here we go.
Good morning, First Christian Church. I just wanted to share a couple of really quick praises uh, to uh, thank you for all that you're doing uh, during this time. Uh, we are so grateful for the continued generosity of our fellowship and uh, on behalf of the finance team. Thank you for all that you're continuing to do. And also want to offer up some sincere thanks to those who've been helping out on the SHED project. Uh, specifically to Randy Long and to Chris Brown and Thomas Brown and to Tim and uh, Trina Hillegross for the uh, wonderful job they have done continuing to keep uh, the grass cut and the church grounds looking great. Uh, we are so appreciative of all each one is doing and thank you for your continued prayers. Uh, please continue to keep uh, the staff uh, there at the church in your prayers. This is a different season in all of our lives. Uh, we continue to trust God to get us through it. Thank you, and God bless you. Amen. Good morning. Welcome again to First Christian Church, Tuscola. We are a church that is loving and living like Jesus. Every week when we come together, we open up God's Word. We learn from it. We grow from it. For the next four weeks, we're actually going to be in a series called Devoted, and it comes directly out of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And so I'd like to begin there. If you're with us and you have your Bibles ready, uh, again, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So again, the believers in the first church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Those are going to be the four topics that we discuss over the next four weeks as we consider what we are devoted to as a gathering of believers who choose to love and live like Jesus here at First Christian Church, Tuscola. It doesn't mean that believers never did anything else but this. It doesn't mean that every time that they did anything ever together that this is all they ever did. But it does mean that they were primarily, fundamentally devoted to these things together. Now this week, our topic specifically is the Apostles' teaching. And for some of us, we know that at the time that this is happening, the rest of the New Testament is not yet recorded and written uh, in, in linguistic form. So they're living it. What they would have been proclaiming then, what they would have been teaching is from the Old Testament, Jesus revealed and Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. They would have testified by eyewitness account of what they had seen Jesus do and how they had seen him fulfill what they knew from the old prophecies. Their lives and the progression of what it was to live in Christ would then make up what we now have as the New Testament as God worked through them, revealing himself to people. For us living today, if we choose to be devoted similarly, this means that we are devoted to the teaching of the Bible in its fullness, both the Old Testament and the New Testament as God's full revelation to man. So again, if you're new with us and you didn't see this coming, uh, the next four weeks are going to play out like this. The first topic is devoted to to teaching God's Word. That's what we're talking about today. Next week, we're going to be talking about devoted to fellowship. The third week, we're going to be talking about devoted to the breaking of bread. And the fourth week is going to be devoted to prayer. These same practices that were present in the first church should be normative in church practice today, and we believe that. The context may change the appearance a little bit, but they should all be present and they should be normative in our times of gathering and worshiping together. As we engage what it means to be a church then that is devoted to teaching the Word of God, the Bible, I think that it's appropriate for us to take a look at First Christian Church Tuscola's doctrinal statement about the Bible. And so I'm going to read from our doctrinal statement right now. The Bible 
is the authoritative and inerrant word of God, the sole and final source of all that we believe. It is God's revelation about himself to man, historically accurate and internally consistent, telling one story of redemption, pointing to Jesus Christ, and giving instructions for morality and the proper conduct of man. God used over 40 different authors inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the 66 books of the Bible. The Bible is the living Word of God, applicable to all time, and is not only the measure and standard of truth, but is absolute truth itself. Now, as a minister with this view of the Bible, such a high view of God's Word, I want to consistently try, consistently help people to discern whether we are following our own personal ideas, whether we are following culture, or if we are in fact following God's word. Additionally, we also want to know that if you ever were to plug into another faith community, let's say your job moves moves you to another town and you end up going to a new church, we want to have equipped you to be able to discern if this new gathering of believers that you're trying to plug in with is devoted to God's word or not. And so we want to help you be able to identify. So let's engage this question today. Are we a group of believers that values biblical Christianity? Now, I think that we are, and I know that we've at least got it on paper, but in our hearts, or... Do we prefer progressive Christianity? Do we prefer consumer Christianity? Do we prefer, in some circles, New Age Christianity? I hope that we prefer biblical Christianity. Our posture and our worldview in our theology, our philosophy, our science, our ideology, our views of mortality and morality and so on, will reveal our actual view of the Bible and whether we believe that it is authoritative or if we simply believe it's just kind of a good book with a few good things to say. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Now, there's an article by a woman named Alyssa Childers Singer, songwriter, famously known as a singer for the the Christian group Zoe Girl, written in 2017, where she raises some good points, some good warnings, some great comments that go along with to pay attention uh, to that that I want to share with you and express to you today that talks about how we are to see whether we are being biblical or not. And so this morning, I'm going to be expounding significantly through parts of her article, and bringing biblical clarity into why this topic matters today. And so with that, we're going to engage five questions to engage while considering your own personal view, as well as our church-wide view of the Bible. These are going to be phrased as warnings in the form of a question. So warning number one that we need to be paying attention for Is there a lowered view of the Bible? Is there a lowered view of the Bible? That's something we should be paying attention for. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you believers. Now, historically, Christians have viewed the Bible as the Word of God, as authoritative and as life-giving and as inerrant. Perfect. We at First Christian Church, Tuscola, we believe those things. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, alt-Christianity generally abandons this type of view about Scripture, emphasizing that personal belief 
can trump anything else, can supersede everything else. And so comments that you might hear while exposing that there might be a lowered view of the Bible is something along the lines of this. You might hear, you know, the Bible was written by fallible humans. And then it's just left there. You guys, that is a half-truth. It is true that the Bible was written by fallible humans, but it negates the entirety of the truth, which also includes that it was written by fallible humans through the direction of God's infallible, omniscient Holy Spirit who guided these humans into perfection. Another comment you might hear that exposes a lowered view of the Bible. You know what? I kind of disagree about that where Paul said such and such. You know, John, he didn't quite have it right there. I know better. You know, when it comes to this, I just, I think maybe Jesus was off. I don't know that he, I just don't agree. Those are the types of things that we would hear from someone who has a lowered view of the Bible. In a sense, these types of comments, what they reveal, they reveal a belief and a potential arrogance that somehow we know now something that God, who is forever, didn't know then when he had these words recorded and inspired them through himself. Another type of comment that you might hear while exposing the danger of lowering a view of the Bible is, you know, the Bible contains the Word of God, but I'm not so sure that it's the, the complete works of God. You guys, that type of comment makes it really hard to discern the divine from what is not. And it leaves the canon of God's revelation completely open, which is inappropriate. It leaves it open to evolve or change or to express a new truth that is beyond what we have at the conclusion through Revelation. Some believe this way. I want you to hear, at least from my perspective, those people are heretics. Warning number two, our feelings emphasized over facts. That's something we need to be looking out for. Our feelings emphasized over facts, biblical facts, personal experiences, feelings, emotions, opinions tend to be valued above objective and biblical contextual truth. So in this type of view, as the Bible ceases to be viewed as God's definitive word, what happens is people's feelings and idea to be true to self take a front seat. They become a more important authority for faith and practice. And sometimes people will start considering this perspective that the Bible might be out of touch, or that it's ancient, or that it's dead, or potentially viewed as irrelevant for today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Some comments that you might hear whenever feelings are emphasized over biblical facts. You know, that Bible verse, it doesn't really resonate with me. I want to be clear about this. That, that really doesn't matter. If a verse resonates with you or not, it doesn't matter. You see, our next point is this. Obedience does not require agreement. Obedience requires submission. When we call him Lord Jesus, our role is to submit, even when we can't understand. Another type of comment you might hear when feelings are emphasized over facts. You know, I used to think that such and such sin from the list of fruits of the sinful nature mentioned in Galatians, I, you know, I used to think that that was really a big deal sin, but then I've, I've, I met this person, I befriended them, and they actually are really awesome, and I've been really rethinking because they seem normal to me, and I'm not so sure anymore, and you know what, I'm, I'm not sure that I should agree with God about that anymore. Again, I want to come back to this. It doesn't matter 
if you agree with the truth to make it true. Okay? Truth is truth, simply and only. And God is the author of truth. His truth is complete. Whether we agree with it, whether we hold it up or not, it's still true. Another type of comment we might hear if feelings are emphasized over facts. You know, I just can't believe that Jesus would send good people to hell. As this is a statement that I know I've heard many times in my life. Maybe not those exact words, but phrased in that way. And I just want to be clear that when we, when we phrase it this way, it's almost as though we're, we're assuming that there are predetermined good people and there are predetermined bad people, and that's how it is. There are good people in the world, there are bad people in the world. Some people deserve heaven, some people deserve hell. But the reality is that we're trying to escape the reality that all people have sinned. If all people have sinned, then all people have fallen short of the glory of God. We know that from Romans. If all people have sinned and all people fall short of the glory of God, then it means that all people are bad. Only Jesus was good. And he said only God is good. A good person is like a unicorn. A good person is like a hobbit in the sense that they don't really exist. It's only through Christ that we can receive salvation. It's only through Jesus that we can be made right with God because we're all bad in our sin. The very fact that God gives us a way to himself, even though we are sinners, shows that God is, in fact, not fair. We've talked about this before. I believe that God is not fair. You see, if God were fair, he would give us the hell that we deserve instead of the grace that we do not deserve. But we would be right to say, this is unbelievable. It truly is unfathomable how gracious God is. Warning number three. Are essential Christian doctrines left open for reinterpretation? Again, are essential Christian doctrines left open for reinterpretation? Now, some people believe that everything is open for reinterpretation all the time. Uh, and they'll note maybe a tradition that was bad once upon a time. And so some people have just landed that all tradition, all dogma, all doctrine are all fair game because they're all passed through the hands of flawed humanity. Anything and everything is open to redefining and reinterpreting. And especially as we look at, at the Bible in, in contrast to uh, hot button moral issues and also cardinal doctrines such as the miracles of God or potentially the resurrection of Jesus or the virgin birth. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Comments you might hear when people are trying to ch change things that they shouldn't be changing are things like this. You know, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't have to be factual to speak truth. You guys, I, let's be clear about this. This is actually why fundamental truth is so important for us as faith followers. If I thought that any of the Bible was fallible, that any of it was false, I could not be a minister of Jesus. I, I couldn't be a Christian because I would be admitting to myself that I believe that partially God lies to people. I can't reconcile that. So either all of it's true or I can't follow him. I can't follow a God who I would believe to be a liar. And if I had to try and reconcile that, I wouldn't follow him today. Interpretation matters for sure. So does trusting God and trusting that he knows more and better and completely about anything and everything than I do. Another type of comment we might hear from this vantage point, this type of warning is, you know, the idea of literal hell, 
That's offensive. To non-Christians, specifically, it needs to be reinterpreted for the time that we live in today. Guys, hell should be offensive. Rescuing us from this real destination required the most supreme sacrifice ever given. And people choosing a life that leads to hell is actually offensive that they would reject God in such a way. Hell's not meant to give us goosebumps and warm feels. Eternity separated from God is what's on the table. Warning number four. Are historic terms redefined? And is cultural bias redefining terms not meant to change? Again, are historic terms redefined? And is culture bias redefining terms not meant to change? Now, some will say that they affirm foundational truth. But then they have to do linguistic somersaults to try to make the Word of God say what they want it to say. And so, some of what we need to engage is, are we unified that the Bible is inspired in the same ways as a body of believers? And are we unified on the same levels? Now, this question comes from that. Will we agree completely on everything? The realist in me says, probably not. Should we? We probably should. But will we? Probably not. So what we have left then is that, but we should agree on the big things. And so if, if you're coming or going to a church or gathering with a group that you are fundamentally in disagreement with about major things, that's a big deal. When there is derailment from these truths, we as a church, as a leadership specifically, we should be guarding the places of proclamation, of teaching, of preaching, because it matters to the eternities of many, and it also matters for the sustaining presence of a biblical gathering of believers to be present. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground purified seven times. Guys, I pray about the sermons that I'm going to bring to you, how God has placed things on my heart to share. I believe he does speak through me, but I also want to acknowledge this, that my sermons are not the same as God's divinely inspired and closed canon. Christianity poetry, Christianity books, Christianity songs are not on the same level as God's word revealed from Genesis to Revelation. The only places that they possibly could be is when they directly quote scripture and use it within the proper context. Now, they may be artistically similar, but they are not on the same playing field. Culturally, we can also be Guilty of taking liberties not meant for us to have. Words like love. Love is a big one in our culture. Love gets hijacked. Love gets plucked out of its biblical context. And it becomes in our context a catch-all term for anything and everything. For things non-confrontational. For things that are pleasant for things that are firming in a quest to pervert love through complete toleration. And we can see how we use love wrong whenever we say, I love Sarah, my wife. I love mac and cheese. Not the same. What we do with words matters. That's true. But then what we don't do with words matters too. To be confrontational doesn't mean to be unloving. It could be, but not necessarily. To be unpleasant or non-affirming doesn't mean that you're being unloving. In fact, the opposite could be true. You might be being very loving. But comments you might hear in, in this type of situation is, you know what, I don't believe that, that God would punish sinners. He's love after all. 
Or maybe you'd hear, sure, the Bible is authoritative. But, or maybe you'd hear this, it's not our job to talk to anyone about sin. It's our job just to love them. You guys, let's just hold that accountable. It's a major cop out. Our responsibility to see people walk into an obedient and submissive relationship with the Lord Jesus matters. And so what we speak matters. But when we do this type of thing, where we say it's not our job to talk about sin, it's almost like we're, we're treating these relationships like that little 80s toy, my buddy or kid sister. And so for your, you Gen Xers, you're welcome for this, but you remember the song, my buddy, my buddy, my buddy and me, kid sister, kid sister. Guys, we're supposed to have conversations that are truly loving. Some of them are affirming, but some of them are unpleasant and confrontational. Both can be love. That said, our hope is for people to humble themselves before the Lord in obedient submission. It's not to humiliate others publicly. Humble and humiliate are so closely related that sometimes we've gotten this one wrong in inexcusable ways. And so I want to encourage you, if you're confused about that, we should be helping people to humble themselves before the Lord in obedient submission to Jesus. If humiliation needs to happen, that's God's work to do. Warning number five. Is the heart of the gospel shifting from salvation, from sin by grace through Christ, to social justice? Again, is the heart of the gospel message shifting from salvation, from sin by grace through Christ, to social justice? This is something we see in some of our faith communities. You guys, there is no doubt that the Bible is clear and even addresses social justice and commands us specifically to take care of the unfortunate or those who are in need and defend those who are oppressed this is an important part of us living out our Christian faith. Here at FCC, we call this loving and living like Jesus. And you may have heard me say before that I believe that Christians should be the greatest humanitarians on the planet, but I also believe that we are called to more than simply humanitarianism. You see, the core message of Christianity, the gospel itself, is that Jesus died for our sins. He was crucified, he was buried, he's resurrected, and thereby he and he alone is able to reconcile mankind to God for eternity. This is the message of Christ as salvation, freedom for the world from sin. He's done everything. It is through him alone. Now you'll find some, some in the world who believe that the concept of God allowing or willing his son to die on a cross in this way for other people to be embarrassing. Maybe they find it appalling. Or maybe they even find it unable to be reconciled from their view or their redefining of love and sacrifice and what they view justice to be as they have found a new cultural definition which they believe to be superior to God's perspective. Sometimes people say, this act of God to son and him being allowed to be crucified in such a brutal way is even on a level of cosmic child abuse. And so the idea of blood atonement is entirely lost and entirely rejected. So what takes its place? Social justice and good works become enthroned in the place of the need for blood atonement. And from that place, we start hearing comments like this. You know, I believe that people should be able to work or good deed themselves into the heaven that they deserve or have earned. We know that you can't earn heaven. There are already religious expressions that think these ways. 
They are not Christianity. Comments you might hear in this type of thinking, you know what? Sin doesn't separate us from God. We're made in His image. And He called us good. This example of using Scripture that way is the same way that Satan used Scripture. He mixed the motives, distorted the truth. It's also where Jesus teaches us that we are to use the full counsel of God's Word. He even shows us that we can say, well, God's Word also says this. You see, a partial view of Scripture is full of deceit instead of holistically and authentically true. Maybe you would hear in this line of thinking, God didn't require sacrifice for our sins. Those first Christians, they picked up on pre-existing pagan practices of animal sacrifice, and they told Jesus uh, his story in similar ways. You guys, blood atonement is not just 2,000 years old. Blood sacrifice has always been part of God's narrative all the way back to the beginning. That sin would require death. So it would actually be the other way around. Pagan practices picked up on a need for atonement through blood sacrifice from God's law of blood atonement. Another type of comment you might hear is, we don't really need to preach the gospel. We just need to show love by bringing justice to the oppressed and provision to the needy. Guys, we do need to speak the gospel. You see, grace through faith is even more primary than the quest for justice. If you really want justice, then you're saying you really want hell because that's true justice. We deserve to be separated from God forever. That's true, pure justice. We really want mercy where we're spared what we deserve. We also want grace where we're given what we don't deserve. Those are more primary. I'm not saying justice doesn't matter. It does. But more primary to the gospel message is mercy and grace through faith accepting Christ. As we finish up today, let me expose this. If we recall, Satan mixed truth with temptation. And he did it to try and lure Jesus himself away from God's purposes. Because of that, we can see that identifying the truth sometimes might be difficult for us. It's not always easy because sometimes false messages are subtle and sometimes they're mixed with a whole lot of truth. And yet they remain completely false because they're not entirely true. Heresies can be seductive. But carried out to their logical end, all heresies are an assault on the foundational framework of God's truth, attempting to disarm salvation through Christ alone. And so we need to be on guard. We need to be biblical. We shouldn't be surprised to find some of these ideas infiltrating some of our circles, some of our friends, and even at times some of our churches. Jesus warned us after all in Matthew chapter 7 verse 15, watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. If you notice any of these five dangers that we've talked about today, I want to encourage you, pray, confront, flee, do whatever you need to do, but do not be taken in by an unbiblical worldview. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so every week we come together, we learn from God's word, we open it so that we can grow. Because we believe God's word is truth. My prayer for us 
is that we would be sanctified, that we would be made into the likeness of Christ by studying his word, by knowing his word, and by living his word out. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that we have it to grow from, to learn from. God, I pray, Lord, where we are wrong in seeing it or reading it or interpreting it, that you would fix that for yourself um, so that we don't muddy the water for anybody else. I pray, God, that uh, you would help people to hear what they need to hear, to acknowledge what they need to acknowledge from your word. Um, I pray, God, that you would continue to speak through your word as we know that it is living and active and able to change hearts and minds and lead us to yourself. It's in your name we pray. Amen.